All right, it looks like it's uh, it's 3.30 here in Moldova. It's time to, to get going with this. Um, so I wanted to thank you all for taking the time to, to join us today. Uh, today we're going to be exploring the magic of cinema, an interesting topic that I, I think should be fascinating. Uh, this presentation is going to be presented by Matthew Marwick, uh, who is an associate with BFC, who has lots of responsibilities that he, he works on and, and does a lot of great help for us at BFC Green or at BFC. Um, he also has his own uh, lifestyle cluster on BFC Green, uh, The Secrets of Storytelling. Uh, so be sure to head over to bfc.green and check that out, along with other wonderful lifestyle clusters. Uh, we can find recipes, uh, music, tips on writing, uh, tips for speaking better. Um, also be sure to check out the Facebook iShare group. It's also a great source for information. And feel free to post there too. Um, we want to make that a discussion where we're sharing lots of cool new information. So if you find something cool, go to iShare on Facebook, post it, and let everyone else enjoy the cool new thing that you found. Um, so let's just jump into the, the magic of cinema, because I'm excited. I can't wait to go. I hope you're all excited, too. Uh, so sit back, and uh, I hope you've all went to the refreshment stand and grabbed some popcorn or some other treats. And with that, we're going to hand it over to Matthew for the magic of cinema. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Brian, and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us today for my presentation on cinematic storytelling. So, in many great movies, uh, we're recalling themes, story structures, and plot devices. So, if you take Citizen Kane, Forrest Gump, or even a, an animation like Toy Story, these are all wonderful movies in their own way, but we also share cinematic tropes and storytelling techniques. In fact, once you know they exist, they can be hard not to spot. So consider yourself warned. <laughs> once you know, there's no going back. Okay, so let's together discover the magic of cinema. Um, we're going to expand on Toy Story in a few moments. But let's start by looking at basic script structure. Feature films typically run for between 90 to 120 minutes, and very occasionally they can extend to three hours and beyond. Honestly, um, it can be an uphill battle to keep an audience engaged for long periods of time. This is why the 90 to 120 minutes Rains uh, feels just about right for a single sitting. Uh, most movies actually find it quite difficult to, to justify more than that. But one of the limitations of this time limit is that films have to be relatively compact, uh, tightly written stories. You know, a, a movie has to tell a complete story from beginning to end, setting up the background, uh, providing a, a conflict or two, a grand finale and some type of denouement. So, as a way of thinking about this, uh, films are often simplified down to a three act structure broken into setup, confrontation, and resolution. So, let's, um, let's apply this technique to Toy Story. How, how would its three act structure look? So, you have the setup. Uh, Rudy is Andy's favorite toy. His status is threatened, an exciting uh, incident. Then Andy receives an exciting new toy, Bud's idea. And of course, at this point in the movie, Rudy and Bud don't actually get along well. Then you have your confrontation, or the middle of the movie, for Rudy and Bud get left behind at gas station. They manage to hit the ride back to Andy's neighbor's house, but now we're trapped and the neighbor destroys toys for fun. But it uh, puts Rudy and Buzz into great danger. And Rudy and Buzz still don't like each other very much. Then you have the resolution, the big escape. Rudy and Buzz overcome their differences and work together to escape from the neighbor's house and get back to Andy. And by the end of the movie, we're best friends. So this approach gets some of the you know, bigger movements of the film, but it also misses out on many of the nuances of storytelling. 
as well as character development, side stories and dramatic themes running throughout the movie. So the three-act approach can be useful as a starting point, but an idea needs to be fleshed out in much more detail and depth before a great script can actually evolve. So it's always coming for boring, and that is useful, but it is definitely an oversimplification. You know, some uh, script writers actually have uh, stories that have, you know, 12 acts or 15 acts, you know, it's, it all depends on on your style and how you actually want to put this film together. But as long as it does have the elements of setting up the scene, providing some type of conflict and bringing it to an end, then you have the three basic ingredients of a story. So let's uh, move on to our storytelling technique. The Big Groom is an example of a cinematic trope. It is a name given to the point in the film when everything seems lost, when the main characters are at the lowest point. But then something will happen to make them hopeful. Say, you know, an intervention by a supporting character or something like that. So this uh, adds dramatic tension for the audience and raises the stakes of the film. And also, from a, a cinematic point of view, it creates space for rising excitement leading into the film's finale. So by pushing your characters to the lowest ebb, it actually gives them the maximum potential to then rise to the best by the end meaning it was a high potential for trains. Um, not all films have a big room, but, but many do. Um, and I think we, we could be quite fun to spot as well when we're happening. Uh, of course, it can take away from, you know, the surprise and things do get better, but I think most people do expect it's going to happen anyway. So let's have a take a look at Toy Story as an example. Um, the big groom would be when Buzz and Rudy are trapped in a neighbor's house. We have no way out, and Buzz breaks off his arm for trying to fry. Uh, Rudy gets trapped in a box, and neighbors planning to destroy Buzz the next day. So things, uh, things aren't going well for them at this point. But then Buzz regains his composure, helps Rudy get out of the box, and they join forces to escape. That's a classic big groom. Um, here is another storytelling technique, the MacGuffin. Now, <laughs> you may think I just made this up, but it's a proper film term. Um, it refers to the prop device used to drive the story forward by providing a reason for conflict and motivation. So it doesn't have to be important to the story other than its use in being a driving force for the main characters or villains. Um, so an example, if it's, I, I just made up myself, would be, say you have two people, you, you have uh, two, two characters, one of them has a briefcase, you can say to the other one, that the contents of this briefcase have the power to train to world. You must make sure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. So in this case, the MacGuffin is a suitcase. Um, it's obviously very important within the film, but as an audience, we actually don't know what it is. But that doesn't really matter. Um, it's, it's value is in its ability to drive and move forward. H however, that doesn't mean that McGovern has to be something the audience doesn't care about. It could also be a character, a desire, a, a mystery, or, or pretty much anything else. It becomes a McGovern then is used as a strong driving force, the motivation within the movie. So some directors perform at Guffins which the audience is invested in, uh, and some prefer to focus on other aspects of the story. It's just a matter of style. And uh, the Tom McGuffin was actually popularized by Alfred Hitchcock in the 1940s. It's not particularly clear where the bard itself came from, but it may have Scottish roots. You know, so it's kind of one of the mysteries. 
Um, so let's go give a quick example on a guffin, and you can uh, take part in this yourself as well. So, what do you think is the MacGuffin in Indiana Jones' Raiders of the Lost Ark? So, just think to yourself what you would imagine it to be. So, of course, it's the Ark itself. This is the object which creates the conflict between the characters and is motivating Indiana Jones and also the bad guys uh, throughout the movie, and it, it presses him on in his adventure. Here is another technique used heavily in film, foreshadowing. Often filmmakers will hint at future events in movies. This can be in the form of metaphors, spoken warnings, or visual clues in the background. Sometimes these will only make sense if you already know what happens in the film, but they provide a nice symmetry to storytelling and can also reinforce the key themes. Sometimes the foreshadowing is very subtle, sometimes it's a bit more clear cut. So, Jurassic Park is a great film, in my opinion, uh, and it's filled with lots of moments of foreshadow. And let's go take us through one example. So, at the beginning of the movie, Dr. Grant, a famed paleontologist, intimidates a child by describing the hunting techniques of Velociraptors. He says that one will act as a decoy and approach from the front, but then two will attack from the sides. Now, at the end of the movie, let's, let's just say that our range of friends learned this lesson the hard way. The main takeaway is that this feat at the beginning of the movie has also served to develop Dr. Grant's character Perfectly foreshadowed an event which would happen much later on. And you can find countless examples in any number of films. Filmmakers really like this technique. We use it all the time. And it's a fun thing to look out for. And that brings us to Trekov's Gun. Now, Trekov's Gun is a rule for a specific type of foreshadowing. The rule is that everything should be in the film for a reason. If it isn't relevant, it shouldn't be there. So, in effect, this means that if something is focused upon in a film, then it will be utilised at a later point. The name comes from Anton Trekhov, uh, the Russian playwright. He said that when writing a play, anything that isn't relevant to the story should be removed. If there's a gun on the wall, and it's a go off before the end of the third act. And that's where the term Trek of the Gun actually comes from. So let's go back to Toy Story as an example. When we see the neighbour holding this particularly large firework, then we can also be pretty certain that we go see something like this, uh, really about to set the firework off. Because why would we introduce such a you know, specific item without intending to actually use it at some point in the film. Another example would be uh, in any number of movies, if it's a scene that involves a large cake, it is almost certain that some unlucky character is going to end up falling right through it. Um, and, and there are countless examples of this product device, and this is a also a, an interesting game to play for watching movies. If you see something be introduced, you can think to yourself, you know, this is going to end up being used later on. But of course, knowing the rule can actually spoil the surprise, but that is something that we have to live with. And that brings us to um, visual imagery. Powerful filmmaking uses visual metaphors to convey aspects of the story. Uh, this provides an additional tool for storytelling, um, adding a, really quite a lot of depth and also different perspective. So, for example, the scene below is from a film about Margaret Thatcher, the UK's first woman prime minister. The scene uses striking visuals to convey how she stood out in a male-dominated parliament. 
So this adds another perspective to storytelling that films are able to take advantage of to great effect. Uh, not many other mediums actually have the ability to uh, use visual storytelling in such a dynamic fashion. And again, every film will use some type of visual imagery and it can really add to the, the fullness of the story. Um, and from audience member, it can give you a lot more to think about while enjoying the film as well. You'll find that uh, the more arty films tend to have slightly heavier visual imagery. Sometimes they can be very subtle, uh, sometimes, you know, far less so. But again, one of my, one of my favorite techniques. And with visual imagery also comes uh, color or color grading. So this is a term given to adjusting the color and the tone of the film itself, of the image that you're seeing on the screen. Uh, directors can use color grading as a technique to differentiate between different themes or, or storylines, or perhaps locations in run films. Um, sometimes even timelines. You know, we have flashbacks or something, it'll probably be a different color scheme if this is being used. Um, it can also be used to convey the emotion of a scene. So, you know, using blue light to indicate sadness or warm colors to indicate happiness, faded, washed out colors can be used to make our location seem more desolate and vibrant, punchy colors make the scene more exciting. Uh, so it's a, it's a real art form, there's a lot of skill to it. And uh, it gives directors um, great potential to really convey the message in a multi-layered approach. And color is very, very important. It's, it's subtle, often don't even realize the differences, but it definitely has an effect. Audience members will always pick up on the, the subtle cues that come from, from color grading. Um, and just to give an example, I've created some, some simple color grading examples using our photograph. So here's a picture I recently took of a snow-covered vent. Um, this is original, by the way. And here it is with the brightness and contrast turned up, making it a, a more striking photo. And uh, here it is with a, a sepia tone. Um, this makes it more, more somber a little bit calmer and perhaps nostalgic, depending. And here it is with a blue filter. It's honestly, I, I think, just looks odd. But, uh, you know, maybe that's the point. Starting directors want things to, to feel like out of place. And color could be a great way of doing that as well. So when you have your riddles, another important aspect of film is also the music, the sound or the score on the film. So I have uh, this picture of La La Land Up that won Best Score about a month ago at the Oscars. And it's a, a wonderful movie and a great example of cinematic scoring. Um, and a score, is, a score, a film score is music written specifically to accompany a film. It is often purely instrumental and can also be very subtle in its application. But the music in a particular scene is vital to building the audience's expectations. It can indicate when something bad is about to happen. It can reflect the character's emotion, or it can increase the level of excitement. Um, musical pieces are also often written for particular characters. So it might be used to introduce them, uh, it might be used to build up audience expectations, uh, and it can also be woven into the score as well to kind of reflect what, you know, if a character is thinking of another character or something along those lines. This is given an example, you know, what comes to your mind when you see a picture of this guy, for instance. Um, you know, you probably think of that, that classic Imperial March, and that's a, a very good example of a, a character theme. So, first I'm going to see. In summary, what we have is that a film structure requires some form of setup, confrontation, and resolution. 
A big groom means that things are going to get better soon. A MacGuffin drives the story forward. Foreshadowing tells you what's going to happen before it does. Chekhov's gun is there for a reason and will always go off. Visual imagery reflects the story being told. Colour grading can be used to convey emotional themes. And that the score, the, the sound is vital to strong storytelling. And I'll leave you one last thought. If you know the rules, you can break the rules. Not every film is going to follow this structure, but aspects of them will often be implemented. And a good director will build to prey with audience expectations and sometimes actually surprise the audience by breaking away from what would be the, the typical case. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Um, I actually had a question. You touched on it there at the end. Uh, if you know the rules, you can break the rules. Um, is there, I guess, any uh, specific director that comes in mind that tends to be very good at this in your mind, or maybe not director, but a, even like a style of movie or something like that? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, sometimes um, if you take uh, comedies especially comedies which are aimed at people who, who enjoy films. So you like, um, think of uh, Shaun of the Dead, for instance. Uh, then in that, they have Simon Pegg, and there's a, a literal gun on the wall uh, called Chekhov's Gun. And we're, we're, we're very much, you know, we're, we're praying with the audience by, by talking about it and saying, you know, does it work, does it not work? Who knows? And of course, we go use it later on. So in some ways, it could be very unsubtle with some of these uh, techniques as well. And you'd also find that some of the um, more experimental directors will definitely try and break the rules a lot more. So we think of a film like The True of Life or something, then it's, it's really preying with audience expectations and um, how you actually experience a film. And some people don't actually like this. So as an audience member, sometimes you, you actually want your expectations to be met. If you, you know, expect two people to get together at the end of the movie, then you actually feel disappointed if it doesn't happen. Uh, you know, if there's a big cake that's brought into a room and it didn't end up smashed on the floor, I, I, I'd be a little bit like, well, I was, I was looking forward to that. Um, so it, it all depends on the audience and what the director is trying to convey. And I guess five people are actually watching a film at that particular moment. Sometimes we want comfort, we want familiarity. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody else have any questions for Matthew? I don't want to monopolize everything here. Give it a couple more seconds for people to unmute. Okay. Um, if not, I guess I have another. Uh, maybe. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Marina. Sorry. Uh, yeah, hello. Hello. Sorry. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe you can recommend us like some films that you would recommend. Like uh, I, I don't know your favorite, um, like um, films from your what you would say would build your character, or I don't know your best like list of your best films, because it's it's really so me personally I for. So it's, it's really so seldom uh, it uh, has time to visit, to go to a cinema to see, and especially I believe it's uh, from your culture. It's, it's got the really very interesting, like how to say, really how to say, advices or something like for learning English and also maybe to learn culture, and at the same time, especially your uh, your place that you was born. Yes, it's interesting. Just maybe or. Uh, as I know, you also you're in a group of filmmakers, mm -hmm. uh, and maybe what's your like uh, how to say examples or something what you say they image or inspired you to to do it? Yes, to which which films? Yes, maybe you can also say some of them or just post on the iShare. Yes, at least uh, 
<laughs> Maybe just a little bit like if you give personally me, yes, <laughs> well, with love. But... Yeah, no. Um, for me, what I find out about films is the, the ability to bring a very abstract idea to life. You know, maybe it's something impossible. Maybe it's something that is just beyond the capabilities right now. But you can, you know, have films about space travel. You can have films about dinosaurs. You can have, you know, adventure films, and it's, it's a great way to to really go into this other world and uh, just make these dreams a, a reality in, in their own way. So when I was growing up, then one of the films that had a, a large influence on me would be uh, probably Jurassic Park, because one, I had dinosaurs, which I doubt when I was young, um, <laughs> but also it, it was about science, it was about uh, moral mysteries, and it was very well put together, and uh, it inspired a sense of awe um, and that translates into different aspects of your life. You know, I've, I have a, a physics degree as well, and I can actually say one of the reasons that I wanted to study physics was to understand more about the universe. One of the reasons I wanted to understand more about the universe was to kind of um, meet some of this inspiration I actually got from watching films like Jurassic Park or like Star Wars or uh, other exciting things that makes me want to know more about the world. Um, so, in terms of films to watch, but it's a, a cultural, then I say that's a great place to start. Yeah, go for the yeah, the, the, the classics. Um, and and things like uh, Toy Story as well, because I talked about Lawrence's presentation, is a fantastic example of filmmaking. Um, wonderfully put together, family friendly, and it works for children and also works for adults. So, I thought Pixar in general are a fantastic company for the culture filmmaking. So, pretty much any movie done by them. Uh, will be enjoyable. That's amazing. Thank you very much, Lisa. Maybe if you put it in also in reading on something like it is really useful. Yeah, yes. definitely. Just to continue this topic, and even now at BC, we are trying to do so many films, short films. Yes. <laughs> I believe you are working already with Brian, and uh, this could be like, uh, see like some examples maybe. Even with this summary rule, so it's it's gave like some orientation. Yes, what what could be what technique could be used? Yes, it's mm -hmm. it's really inspiring in our business. Yes, thank you very much, Matthew, for your initiative. Uh, hi, Matthew. I have also a short question. Um, how important is the story behind uh, making a particular movie? Let's. Uh, take uh, as example a few movies that I think uh, you definitely watched is uh, Barry Lyndon of Kubrick, uh, Do a List by Ridley Scott. Sorry. And uh, uh, I'm interested in the way how they made the movie look uh, like they are looking. Uh, so, how Ridley Scott used the lighting equipment mm -hmm. and how Kubrick chose to use the uh, special lens for filming uh, uh, some scenes. So actually, if you watch the movies, you see that uh, the image is looking quite similar, but uh, when you read how it was done, you understand <laughs> that it was filmed in a totally different manner. So uh, is it important for us, uh, the people who watch movies, to know how the movie was done, uh, what, was, uh, what, uh, what kind of equipment was used, and so on? Um, I, I would say it's an interesting thing to to find out about. So it's something that I find very interesting. But your your typical audience member probably doesn't have to know the particular techniques behind the movie, because like one of the, the great things is that you know every every movie is an illusion, uh, you know, cruelly. But if it's done well, then you're actually completely forget about that. You'll you'll become a mask in the story being told, and that's when movies aren't the best. Um, but at the same time, the, if you really enjoy the subject, then it's a great thing to find out about, and it's fascinating uh, to to see some of the different ways that we actually, actually see a particular lighting, or got uh, reactions from characters, or, um, you know, we pieced it together in a technical sense. So some of this can be a, a massive feat in terms of management and 
uh, teamwork and you know creative collaboration between all these different um, skills coming together for a single product. Um, so yeah, it's definitely. So it's, to, to summarise, I I think it's a great thing to find out about. Um, but from an audience point of view, then to enjoy the movie at its peak, then you don't actually have to know about it because that's the final product which you're taking in. Thank you for that, Matthew. Um, we're we're at our time uh, limit for today, but uh, if anyone has any other questions, I'd be happy to to allow one more to get through. So, speak now or forever hold your peace, as you like to say. Um, so, uh, thank you for your presentation, Matthew. I guess it will be great to maybe have um, a presentation about some secrets or structures of some independent films. I think it would be interesting for us just because of um, even some independent filmmakers now are involved in producing um, some cinema or TV products for masses. That's why. I think it would be great for us to know about some secrets or some tricks. If we uh, speak about independent cinema in general. Yeah, 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 definitely. Um yeah, so independent films definitely have a different set of techniques fits fits are, are used and a different set of limitations as well. And it's interesting because uh, sometimes having a low budget can actually force you to become much more creative um, in how you actually utilize the budget and you know create your final your final film. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd be, be happy to look into doing a presentation based on independent films as well. Fantastic. So it sounds like we have uh, some topic ideas for for future uh, presentations. Um, with that, I, uh, I'm sorry, I have to go with a really cheesy pun here, and I, I think the credits are starting to roll on our presentation here. Um, <laughs> again, I apologize, that was a horrible pun. But um, be sure to go check out uh, bfc.green. Um, you can check out Matthew's Lifestyle Cluster Group, The Secrets of Storytelling. Um, there's lots of good information there. Uh, again, you can also check out the other lifestyle clusters uh, for recipe ideas or uh, hints and, and tricks for speaking or writing uh, music. Um, if you're interested in a, li a lifestyle cluster of your own that you'd like to host, uh, feel free to get in contact with Marina. She'd be more than happy to, to set you up with that. Um, I also want to encourage you to go to the iShare Facebook group. Fantastic resource for you to get ideas, but also share them with the rest of us. Um, it's all about community, and we want to make sure that we have a, a community that likes to share the fun things that we find in life and the enriching things in life. Um, be sure to join us next week for um, more interesting information and some fascinating discussions. Uh, we'll be here every week on Thursday, so just book us in your calendar, pop on in, and uh, enjoy all the information that you can soak up. Uh, so with that, thank you, Matthew, uh, for the fantastic presentation, and thank you, everyone, for being here. We look forward to seeing you next week.